welcome to the Anxious Love Coach Podcast, a place for creating meaningful, conscious, secure, long-term partnerships. Here, we talk relationship anxiety and creating healthy, magnetic dynamics within partnership to help you feel confident and alive within committed partnership. My name is Natalie Kennedy, and I'm your host. I'm a relationship anxiety coach and meditation teacher. I've worked with hundreds of clients battling anxiety, and after experiencing extraordinary shifts in my own healing relative to partnership, now combine my lived personal experience and professional training to help others trust themselves within relationship and in their lives. I've been to the edge and back with my now husband from relationship anxiety and come out confidently to the other side. I want to pass the tools I've learned along to you to help you trust yourself in relationships and also create magnetic, hot dynamics with your partner. I believe lots of mainstream relationship advice today can make us anxious and dissatisfied. So let's jump in and normalize challenges that modern relationships and real people go through while also giving you tools to trust yourself, drop the shame, and alchemize your messy, twisted relational truths into profound inner wisdom and aliveness. If you haven't yet, be sure to join my communities over on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Anxious Love Coach. You can also request a 30-minute relationship anxiety assessment with me depending on availability or ask me a question over on my website at www.anxiouslovecoach.com. I've also got a wonderful relationship anxiety meditation available to you as thanks for subscribing to my email list. Thanks for being here and enjoy this episode. Hello. Welcome back to the podcast. In today's episode, I want to give you a very simple question that will help you ground yourself in reality and actually move forward in your life if you're stuck on the fence over your relationship. When I was struggling with relationship anxiety, I was riddled with doubt, doubt in myself, doubt in my partner, doubt in my relationship. On the one hand, I knew that my anxiety was the issue, or at least a significant piece of the issue, but I also had some resentment in my relationship, and there were a lot of videos online telling me that my partner was no good, and that he would never change, and I would never be happy. These types of videos would send me into a panic because I thought that I was getting, or was going to get, eventually, the short end of the stick and either succumb to an unhappy marriage or end up divorced. So the way I would respond to this was to try and control and change my partner, now husband, Preston, hoping that if I could change him and get him to live up to this imaginary standard that I was seeing from social media, that I could relax in the knowing that I'd picked a good one. And inevitably, when he didn't match up and he disappointed me, I'd resent him for not living up to this made-up standard, and then I would panic, thinking that my resentment was a sign to leave. I often oscillated between the following perspectives. One, either I'm broken and flawed, and I need to just get rid of my anxiety and potentially stuff down or accept my resentment and disappointment. Or two, these videos are right my partner sucks and I just need to leave. And I figured one of these perspectives must be true, right? Well, that's terrifying. <laughs> both of both of these are terrifying thoughts and we're oscillating between them trying to figure out which one is true. Do I suck or does my partner suck? Ah, <laughs> neither of them are true, actually. You're not broken and flawed and your partner isn't broken and flawed. And resentment has less to do with our partners often and more to do with us and our expectations causing the suffering. And no, you don't necessarily need to leave. Now, I do feel like I should address a disclaimer. This does not apply in cases of abuse, especially physical, um, or your partner has a serious active addiction to substances like alcohol or hard drugs or gambling or cannot be faithful to you and has a philandering problem. I'm not talking about a hookup with someone that happened before you were official five years ago or having the occasional crush without them acting on it. Obviously, there's these are nuanced and some people might disagree with me and I don't have the answers, but I'm talking about someone who cannot stay faithful to you. Um, if you need help with discernment, and have specific examples that you need help figuring out, is this, is this toxic or not? Feel free to shoot me a Wizio or seek out a licensed therapist and have a conversation with them. Okay. So now that I've laid that disclaimer out, 
Resentment, like I said, has less to do with our partners than it does with us and our expectations, which causes suffering. And no, you don't necessarily need to leave. We need to examine a lot more first, especially if you want to continue to make it work with this person. Many of us with relationship anxiety believe that we have to wait until we feel connected in a relationship before we give ourselves permission to open our hearts and act as if we are all in. Newsflash, no, you don't. <laughs> Love is as much of a feeling as it is a practice. And sometimes, dare I say, loving someone isn't going to feel authentic. Imagine if your parents or your caregivers stopped feeding you and changing your diaper when they were feeling irritated or disconnected with you. Um, if that has happened to you, I'm so sorry. This is a terrible analogy, but I hope you get what I'm going for. Sometimes you're not going to feel like it and you show up anyway. Uh, this has been one of the most profound shifts in my relationship because I would hope that my partner does the same for me. If I'm feeling sick or angry or withdrawn or depressed, I hope that my partner will continue to see the best in me and show up for me and take care of me and feed me and love me in the same way that he loves me, um, or a different way, but still loving as when he is feeling it. I want my partner to, to act as if he loves me, even if he's not feeling it. And because I want that from my partner, it is critical that I do the same, that I choose to love my partner, even if I'm not totally feeling it. The irony is that when I do this, my partner glows and ends up being more attractive and lovable to me. Whereas when I'm on the fence, he's defensive and he becomes less attractive to me. So if you want a shot at experiencing unconditional love in your partnership, it will benefit you more than you know to accept your partner as they are right now. Now, accepting your partner does not mean bending over backwards and taking over the areas where they're slacking off. If you're feeling resentful, examine where you're doing stuff that you either never agreed to do or you don't want to be doing anymore. You can't control whether your partner picks up their socks off the floor, but you can decide to not pick them up and wash them for them. If you're swamped and you're tired of doing the dishes because your partner hasn't offered to do so, don't do the dishes. At some point, you're going to run out of dishes <laughs> and they're going to have to clean it up. <laughs> Obviously, this is easier said than done. This is a whole dynamic that I have tinkered with for years and I literally work with one-on-one -on -one clients helping them navigate this dynamic where they want to change it. Um, in my courses, I talk about ways to make requests and share desires in a way that makes it more likely your partner will enthusiastically take care of you without feeling like you're doing verbal gymnastics. Cause it, it really, it's, it really doesn't have to be complicated. You don't need to twist your words into a pretzel to kind of inspire your partner to want to take care of you. It's, it's actually quite simple. I talk about it in my conscious communication course and watch your language. These are both short courses because they're simple. Communication should be simple. A lot of us try to make it super complicated. It doesn't need to be. Um, but I share this to let you know that resentment is not necessarily an indicator that your partner isn't the one. It's a sign you said yes somewhere where you would have liked to have said no. And in doing so, your people pleasing has poisoned the relationship. So if you're feeling resent resentment and having doubts about your relationship, you have three choices. You can one, leave. You can two, stay, but be on the fence, close your heart and wait for them to change before you change. Or you can three, stay and go all in and get vulnerable and let go of control. Uh, I can tell you from experience that number two, being on the fence sucks. When my man used to be able to tell I to be able to feel that I was on the fence, he'd be in this constant state of defense. He was always waiting for me to pack my bags. He was waiting for the other shoe to drop. He was waiting for every conver He was waiting for the conversation where we need to talk. Uh, he was waiting for me to step on landmines in the relationship. He was tiptoeing around potential landmines in the relationship. And when he was in that really hyper vigilant state of defensiveness, he was quicker to snap. He was quicker to shut down, quicker to defend himself, more passive, more walking on eggshells. And guess what? That was not sexy to me, which would make me on the fence even more. So it's safe to say that 
I was being abusive by subconsciously always testing him. This is not rewarding in the slightest. It did nothing to bring us connection. Now I do want to preface or not preface. I want to just say that a lot of this is not just me deciding to behave this way. You know, a lot of it was trauma and my relational beliefs and, you know, my, uh, my criticism was coming because deep down I was actually really, really frightened. And that fear was something that had been present long before I even entered my relationship with Preston. So if this is you and deep down underneath your nitpicking, you're actually really terrified of giving up control. I hear you. I see you. It's really difficult and overcoming this and healing some of your trauma and also experiencing the beauty that comes with surrendering in your relationship. It cannot be overstated. Um, it's something you want to get help with as soon as possible because um, your relationship will be so much more healing and fulfilling for you. I promise. I really believe that. Um, if you are in a partnership, it benefits you to be all in for as long as you are in it until the day you're done. You can always change your mind. So at the risk of being a little bit counter to what you might have heard, I'm going to suggest if you are on the fence that you do not act like it. I know this goes against being authentic, but let me tell you, sometimes being authentic in partnership has not benefited me because sometimes being authentic, I just want to ramble forever and beyond my partner's capacity. Uh, Sometimes being authentic has resulted in me saying really hurtful things to my partner that did nothing to add benefit to the situation. So I want to question this idea that authenticity means always sharing how you feel and always sharing what's on your mind in the name of being honest. I think it's only helpful to be honest if you're actually going to add benefit to the situation. I have become a big fan over the years of kind of conscious secret keeping, not secrets that my partner should know, but my partner doesn't need to know the secret of the terror in my body when he is cooking, (laughs) when he puts a plastic spoon on the edge of a uh, frying pan and I'm worried that the plastic is going to melt and we're at an Airbnb and I'm afraid that he's going to melt the plastic of the Airbnb host's spatula and that they're going to get mad at me. Like that, that is not helpful. It's exhausting for me to worry about, and it's exhausting for my husband. I'm, I assure you that when you get your eyes back on your own paper and you start trusting, it's so much more satisfying and it is worth it to work with that fear. So if you're terrified of giving up control in your relationship and actually practicing, uh, accepting your partner as they are, even if Every habitual part of you wants to try to change them. This is some of those most powerful work you can do. So I say, if you're in partnership, be all in for as long as you are in it until the day you're done. Again, you can always change your mind. So do your inner work to feel more secure in your own private time. And in the meantime, start getting better at communicating. But that question that I want to invite you to ask yourself if you're stuck, if you're stuck, this is the question that I want you to ask yourself. And it's actually not my question. It's actually from Laura Doyle, um, a coach I very much look up to and respect and agree with. The question is, are you leaving today? Are you leaving today? If yes, you have your answer. If no, that's great. Let's get to work. (laughs) So love is not for the faint of heart. It's time to get vulnerable. And I love this question because you can always change your mind. If you want to leave tomorrow, you can leave tomorrow. But while you're in the relationship, do what you got to do to open your heart and get vulnerable. Even if it doesn't feel authentic to be vulnerable, even if it doesn't feel authentic to let your partner uh, do their hair the way they did it, even if it feels vulnerable to let your partner go out wearing Crocs, like, It will do so much for your relationship to make your partner feel safer to be themselves. They're more likely to take initiative and take risks because they don't have to worry about being criticized anymore. I've seen this time and time again in my own relationship and also with clients. So I hope that that is helpful. And if you are looking for support around this, I am taking on new one-on-one clients right now. And just to talk a little bit about my process, when I take on clients, um, I have a really interesting kind of nuanced perspective. I'm not a therapist. 
I say that over and over. I'm not an OCD specialist. If you're looking for like a clinical approach, licensed therapist is great. Um, ERP therapy, if you have OCD is great. But personally, I look at this from a very human perspective. And as someone who has lived it, I am a uh, yoga and meditation teacher. That's my background, but I also have a coaching background. I've received certifications in both of these things. And a lot of the yoga and meditation work is more inner work. And a lot of my coaching is more outer work. So what I mean by that is the inner is about your inner experience. It's about expanding your capacity for discomfort um, and knowing how to bo- both be with and process big emotions that come up in partnership. Um, it's also about resolving your karma with your caregivers that may be playing out in this relationship. Uh, it's also about getting opposing sides of yourself on the same page. And for me, this is all inner work. It's stuff we can do with our eyes closed. It's about making movement and moving energy in your body and knowing how to transition and change your internal state, how to change how you're feeling um, by really getting to know the feeling. So this is the stuff that we do in our own spaces. Um, this is all about like rituals that I, that I teach my clients to be able to host with for themselves. Now the outer work is fun. Actually inner work can be fun too, but the outer work is about what you do outside of yourself, how you interact with your partner, um, how to communicate better, what to do, what to say, Uh, the beautiful thing is this stuff is quite simple. It's about playing with patterns and dynamics in partnership, using these parts of yourself that you've discovered through your inner work and bringing them online into the relationship so that your partner can see different sides of you and experience different versions of you that may have been missing in the relationship so that you can evoke different sides of your partner and experience them differently. When your partner gets to experience you differently, they get inspired to show up differently as well. And we get to experience our partners differently. This is why I uh, believe that while couples counseling can be really helpful, it's not necessary. It only takes one person to change or fuck up a relationship. So if you've got a machine and all of the parts are connected and one, it only takes one part to break the machine, but It could also, it might also just take one part to kick things into gear if they've been stagnant for a while. So that's a really beautiful part. If you've been stuck in a pattern, you don't need to tell your partner, I'm going to hire Natalie, the coach, because I need to figure out how to live with you, you loser. Like (laughs) you don't need to tell them that you're, you're getting support. You can quietly do a course in your own time and just start quietly implementing these tools. You can quietly hire a coach or quietly do therapy just to get your eyes back onto your own paper humbly and your partner doesn't need to know. This is one of those conscious secret keepings that I recommend. Keep your eyes on your own paper and let them quietly, slowly witness you as you change and they will change as well. So again, the outer work is about playing with these patterns and dynamics and partnership, using the tools in your inner work to bring more sides of yourself into the partnership. Some sides of those might be the one that knows how to lovingly set boundaries, the one that no names the one that has desires, the one that names desires, the one that apologizes, the one that doesn't apologize, the one that owns their stuff on their side of the street. It's also like I'm kind of alluded to before. It's learning how to change your partner without them knowing this is all about uh, showing up differently to kind of trick, or like I said, evoke your partner's change without them knowing. How do you get your partner to want to take out the trash as opposed to just making them get take out the trash. That is the art of evoking because you don't, you don't want them to, uh, I'm just trying to think of an example here. You don't want to make them take out their trash against the, their will. That's not satisfying. You want someone who is happy to take out the trash and does it because it feels good to take care of you. If you want to have that level there needs to be a certain level of trust that that you are communicating to them. And how do we do that? It's absolutely possible, in my opinion. At least I think it I think it's beneficial to believe that in partnership. So, like I said, your partner doesn't need to know you're doing this work. In fact, I explicitly recommend against it. Not everything needs to be shared with your partner. Um, so some suggestions for you if you are looking to get that kind of support. Um, You can work at your own pace through my online course, Both Feed In. I also have other courses like my conscious communication course, my watch your language course. Uh, If you have a tendency to compare your relationship, I have a seven day little, little baby series called seven days quit comparing your relationship. Otherwise, if you're looking for quick one-on-one support, um, you can shoot me a Wizio request 
And if you are at a position where you want to apply for a longer one-on-one coaching program doing, as I said, both the inner and the outer work, I am taking one-on-one clients right now. I have a, you know, my basic, uh, relationship anxiety program called overhaul. And I also have a more polarity based program for women who are in partnership with masculine beings, um, called evoke his devotion. This is more about how to change your partner through how you're showing up. So I guess it, the overhaul program is definitely going to be more of an inner work process for those of you that feel confident with the inner stuff and you want to move towards the more outer playing polarity don- dynamics. That one's going to be called evoke his devotion. Honestly, though, they're the same price. So if you're like, I'm not sure, just pick one. We'll figure it out in the session, the, the, the assessment, and we'll go from there. So that's it. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm very grateful to have recorded a shorter session today. <laughs> Usually I talk for a long time, but that is it. Um, l- another last note is our Patreon call. Next Patreon call where I uh, answer your questions both in the comments that I open up a few days before, but also live on the call, almost like a, basically a live coaching group coaching session. Uh, the next call is going to be on September 20th at 9am Pacific time. I do one call every month. So that's it. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you're coming to Patreon, I look forward to seeing you in person ish on zoom in the zoom room Yeah. If you're on the fence, ask yourself, are you leaving today? If you're not, let's get to work. Let's open our hearts. Let's get vulnerable and let's do the work because it's going to be some of the most valuable work you'll ever do. Thanks so much for tuning in. Good luck. And I'll catch you in the next episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Anxious Love Coach today. If you loved this episode, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube and maybe share it with someone that you believe might benefit from these perspectives. Please also subscribe to my email list at www.anxiouslovecoach.com as I'm trying to reduce my reliance on social media. In exchange, you will receive my free relationship anxiety meditation and more supportive tools sent your way. If you would like to work with me, head on over to my website at, again, anxiouslovecoach.com to explore different tiers of coaching options and online programs. Thanks again for listening and catch you in the next episode. Have a blessed day.